Hey everybody, welcome. This is Two Ed Tech Guys. Two Ed Tech Guys take questions and share cool stuff. And if you know the whole title, you know how it works. And as it turns out, we are very happy to be able to share a few ideas with you along the way as well. Uh, we can do this via such things as turning on the captions, which I think is a cool little tech tidbit to know. Uh, if you're in Google Slides, then, then you're able to do that. So big thumbs up to that, even though it ends up with one tremendously long sentence. So thank you for joining us. We hope that uh, the, the questions that we answer will give you some cool ideas about the stuff you do at your school and about your teaching, because this is not just about tech, it's about teaching with tech, which we think is a cool and interesting thing, which is why we do this show. Now, Richard, my, my partner in this little effort, is, is the mind behind Free Tech for Teachers. And Richard, just in case people don't know what that is, why don't you tell them a little bit about it? FreeTechForTeachers.com is a website I started 15 years ago to document a whole bunch of free and cool ed tech stuff that I was finding on the web and trying it out in my classroom. And 15 years later, I'm still doing it. I believe you've uh, put a few posts out over that period of time. About 17,000. All right. All right. All right. Well, you know, keep at it and you'll get somewhere. <laughs> 17,000. That's amazing. All right, cool. I run a little thing called Next Vista for Learning. It's a free library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content, my own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. And we've got videos about academic topics, short, uh, where kids were like, hey, look at it this way. We've got videos about communities around the world, about service to others, and plenty of other things as well. Uh, give it a good look. See that little contact up there. Happy to help you use the site. It's all free. And uh, let's dive into the questions that are part of Two Ed Tech Guys Take Questions. Richard, get us going. Start us with the hey, first one. But Rustin, first, do you want to plug your video contest? Because I just did this this morning. Oh, absolutely. Good man. Yeah. So you will you will actually hopefully see this on the, uh, the <laughs> now I wonder, will you see this on the front page? We just started our, our 90 second edu video contest. All right, this is called Creative Storm 22. I will get that link into the chat for everybody and also into the, the links that we share. I'll get that to the email that I send you afterwards if you registered for this show, things like that. But it works this way, right? If you have some topic and you're like, I want kids to be better at this topic, get the kids themselves to take a shot at putting together a 90 second or shorter video explaining that topic. So we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna do it with stop motion. We're gonna do it with uh, you know mime. It doesn't, doesn't matter what it is, but just something that would allow other kids to go, oh, that's what that is. And kind of get over the hump with some particular challenge they have with the topic. Man, we've had some good videos over time through this contest and we are excited to have the fall 22. It was a bit Northern hemisphere centric, but still. Fall 22 version of it uh, to share now. Richard, you are a gem, a scholar and a saint for, for encouraging me to mention such a thing. Yeah, there's a lot of video contests happening this fall. Uh, actually, I'm going to shameless commerce division in my life. I'm going to plug a, a whole roundup of them tomorrow in a blog post because there's a whole bunch of cool ones happening right now kind of across the web for a whole bunch of different uh, content niches and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I'll check that out. So. Anyway, let's jump into the first question, which is one that's uh, a little bit nuanced, as we kind of alluded to before we actually started today. Um, and it starts, it's from Kim, who starts by saying, I'm curious as to your opinion about Kahoot. My students have used it in other subjects than the one I teach. Recently, a history colleague had them use to create study tools to prep for a quiz. We found in study hall on Friday afternoon, the kids gaming and not studying. They showed us that they actually had to answer questions to prep for the quiz to be able to play. All right. Uh, and she goes on to talk more about how the kids were using it. It's a long, it's a long email. But anyway, point being, she gets to I will not be using Kahoot as I see no value in it. My colleague will certainly monitor and limit the extent he can. What other platforms between beyond Quizlet and quizzes would you recommend? What else do you encourage your students or colleagues to offer as different study methods, tech-free or tech-wise? Uh, so 
I will say this. I think there is a time and place for things like Kahoot. Uh, I've used them with students in social studies. I've used them with students in computer science. And in both cases, it's a lot of fun. But in both cases, any activity, any quiz game, any game in Kahoot that's more than about 10 questions, and kids get bored with it. Uh, and, and there's some other, you, you got to know your students because I think that for some students, it's great. It's fun. It helps them practice and recall some fun facts. For other kids, it's discouraging because they might know the answers, but they don't answer as fast as the others. Uh, so there's a time and place for it. Uh, you know, but you gotta you gotta know your students, and this is true for Kahoot, Socrative, quizzes, Quizzalize. What other games are like that, Russian? That I'm missing. Um, well, I'd, I'd say quizzes is my favorite one. But, quizzes, yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, I'd, but there, there's, there's kind of one one thing about it. You know what? I hear somebody say something like, "I see no value in it." I get it. If you see it normally being used and has very little value other than to get people excited. I get it. I, I understand the like, I'm not going to use that. But the the real work of an educator is to be like, how might I turn that into something really valuable? And one of the things that any, whether you're talking about one of these tools or some interesting chalk and slate game, if if you're working with, with uh, multiple choice and you have students like group up and come up with questions, and I don't mean like two plus two equals four, banana, cosmology i mean like not that right but but rather like they have to come up with one or more correct answers and then the the wrong answers need to be plausibly wrong so the students have to explain someone might think this is the answer because they don't understand this here and that's how they got to this and that's the kind of thing they can get a lot of kids who are having difficulties with particular comment uh, uh topics in your class to be able to kind of work their way through it. What? Really? Is that? Oh, got it. You know, so having having the exercise of having them create questions where that is a part of it can be really valuable. Right. Yeah. And, I, and to follow up on that, I'll say the, the other part of her question that we don't want to miss in there, uh, other platforms beyond Quizlet and Quizzes, uh, depending on your students, again, and you kind of have to know your students, you know what they need, right? That, 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 that's always the, the challenge, I think, for both of us, Russian. Whenever somebody says, hey, can you tell me, tell me the best tool for X with my fifth graders or X with my eighth graders? Like, tell me more about your kids. Tell me more about what your students need and where they are right now. But anyway, all that to say, Another alternative that I really, really like is called Note, uh, Note.io. I think we mentioned it in a webinar probably last year. Uh, might have even mentioned that one last month, actually. That, that, that's, we, uh, we, we, we might have, yeah. Note.io. Uh, I've been a fan of it for a, a couple of years because it will let you take your text and it turns it into not only flashcards, but also practice activities activities that are more than just multiple choice questions. Uh, you can do short answer activities in there. Uh, so I think it's a really, really pretty useful tool. Uh, cool. What's our right. next question? Next question uh, came from John, who said, I heard Canva just dropped a ton of new features. Any chance might do a video on how the new features could be used by teachers, especially those who use the free Canva for education. I'm interested in the whiteboarding feature, but it isn't immediately apparent in the version they have for education, although I could just be missing it. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> short answer is yes. Uh, I have, I am making videos about it. I have made a couple of videos about the new features. Uh, the ton of new features that they dropped was actually more just an announcement of, hey, here's a whole bunch of stuff we're gonna have. It's kind of like kind of like Apple does with their uh, with their announcements. Like, hey, well, this is a whole bunch of stuff that's coming soon, but isn't actually available yet. And that's kind of what Canva did. Uh, that said, a couple of those things are available now. Uh, one of them is in the video editor. 
and it is a tool for removing the background from any live video that you have shot, like you know, a video of me in front of anything. Uh, and you can essentially make a green screen video, even if you don't have a green screen. So that's cool. Uh, so that's a new thing you can do in Canva. The whiteboarding, let's tell you about the whiteboarding feature. The whiteboarding feature's actually always been there. Now they've just made it a heck of a lot more obvious uh, <laughs> because now they have templates for whiteboarding. You could always do it in the past. You could always just take a big blank white template in Canva and invite someone else to collaborate on it with you. And boom, you've got a whiteboard. Now they just actually have whiteboarding templates. Uh, but I did make a video about that. You can find them on my YouTube channel uh, or freetechforteachers.com and search for Canva. Uh, and I have made videos about both of those. Uh, but Rustin, you've got uh, something else to throw in there. Yeah, I was just going to say that if if what you're looking for out of Canva is is you know kind of more in the way of the art of it and, and the way you can pull together different things, whether it's a social media post like thing or uh, simple videos or something, take a look at Adobe Express, express.adobe.com. That's a, that's a cool tool. And uh, I, I find that it's the it's my go-to for making a really simple video really quickly that looks kind of good. Uh, and so a lot, a lot there. And one of the things about Express is that, I mean, and, and granted, my info on Canva might be a little old, but I, I remember getting into Canva, kind of working with it and, and be getting kind of annoyed that there were things that were that were not free that it wasn't obvious that it wasn't free to me like right away or it was mixed in with the free stuff. And that, I don't know, hopefully that's no longer the case, but I was just like, ah, no good. You probably didn't have a Canva for education account in Russian. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. Maybe I was just uh, working with the regular. Yeah. All right. Should yeah. we do another one before we get to the, uh, the, the shares? Yeah, let's do. So Tova sent us two questions. We'll do one of them now and one of them after. How about huh. that? All right. So the first one was uh, a teacher wants a live fundraiser thermometer that he can input info and it can move up. It's not with money. It's more with minutes in the classroom. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah. Go to flippity.net. Uh, flippity.net for anything that, that it's Google spreadsheet related and you want to do something cool with it, go to flippity.net you will find all kinds of templates to do cool things with Google Spreadsheets. And I'll put a little link in the chat. And you can find everything from virtual manipulatives to typing games. And there's even a leaderboard. I'll put the link to the leaderboard template in there. There's also a progress meter, uh, progress indicator. Great name do. picker in there. There's name picker. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Word scramble, mm -hmm. uh, a Wordle-like template, although they can't say Wordle because that's property of the New York Times now. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so it's a Wordle-like game. But anyway, there's a, there's a link to the progress meter, progress indicator in Flippity. But yeah, check out Flippity.net for all things for cool data visualizations uh, with spreadsheets. Speaking of cool, what, what is this focusable thing that you are sharing? All right, so focusable is pretty cool. Uh, full disclosure, they did an advertising campaign on freetechfeatures.com. If they hadn't, I would be using this tool because it, what it does is it teaches you to focus on the work that you're trying to avoid <laughs> or, the, or the, the work that you don't really want to do, but you know you got to get it done, like answering 75 emails from parents or whatever it is, right? Um, it, it, instead of being, it's not a browser extension. It's not, it, it's, a, it's a website you can use. You can also use it as a mobile app. What it does is it sets a timer for you for five minutes to start your work. And then after five minutes, it says, okay, take, how did you feel? Take a deep breath, record a short video, 
explaining how you felt in that five minutes, like really short video. Right? And then after you record your video, it says, okay, take a deep breath and now work for 10 minutes. And you work for 10 minutes, try to work for 10 minutes uninterrupted. And then you do the process again, record a short reflection. How'd you do? Boom. Then one more time, take that deep breath and then work for 20 minutes and then do a reflection at the end. Now you can adjust the intervals if you want to, but those are the default intervals. And I have found it has been great for me to focus on work that I don't want to necessarily do. Uh, because I, that five minute, I can like, you can do anything for five minutes, right? That gets you started on the process. Now, the cool thing for teachers is that you can create a classroom account. And so your students can use this and you can actually watch their video reflections and give them feedback on what they say in their video reflections. If you want to, you don't have to, but you can. Uh, the videos are private. The only people who can see them are the student and you. No one else can see them. Uh, like even the rest of the class can't see them. It's just you and the student, and that's it. Uh, and I, I, like I said, I've been using it personally, and I love it. Uh, I've used over the years all kinds of browser extensions to try to block myself from going to Facebook or block myself from going to Twitter or whatever. And those all work for a little while, but they're not really training you to start that focus process. And I'm finding that this is just a really great way to get myself into that flow, even when I don't want to get into the flow. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really, it is training yourself to work for 35 minutes uninterrupted, except for the, you know, 30 seconds where you record a video in between that five, 10 and 20 minute break. But all right. Well, that's cool. Uh, really I have cool. not heard of that one. That, that's, that's yeah, cool. check it out at getfocusable.com. Uh, I've got a bunch of blog posts about it too. You got to check it out. Absolutely. Uh, you know, my, my tendency in the sharing cool stuff uh, tends to be like cool videos. And uh, this is a video from Imbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. It's, it's all of a minute and change long, right? But it's about a fish with a transparent head. I mean, how cool is that, right? Uh, and, and, and additionally, right? So, you, and, and it's, it's not just some cartoon like from that, that it might look like from the screenshot. This is like some really interesting footage. So one of the most interesting things about it is that it has these kind of funky eyes that appear to be within the head, which if you think about it, your head's transparent, your eyes don't need to be on the surface of your head. That to me was like a, whoa, kind of moment. So, uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of stories I've shared over time, you know, stuff that, that really kind of speaks to the humanity of something. I just thought a, a transparent headed fish was something that we just had to like get out there so that people could use it. Get this in front of the kids. Kids, what do you think? Would you want a transparent head? You know, whatever, whatever, whatever it might be that represents a... Uh, uh, a, a prompt for discussion in, in that regard. So there you go, the barrel eye, the fish with the transparent head. Well, that's that's a good prompt for uh, the Creative Storm video contest, actually. You know, I mean, there are so many- How would life be different if you had a transparent head? <laughs> it, and, and, I, and I have to say, I've never had the discussion before about what it would be like to have a transparent head. This is a totally new topic. And here we are. And, and you know, if, if, this, if this represents what it's like to be on like some illicit substance, I guess I've now experienced that because never before, too clean. <laughs> All right, let's, let's see if we can get another two, maybe three questions in before we wind things down. All right, cool. Uh, so a question from, oh, the, the second question from Tova. Uh, a teacher has two documents that he uses interchangeably for lesson plans. They are different views and used for different purposes. He wants to know if he can somehow connect them so that when he inputs info on one, it automatically can populate on the other document. Is this possible? I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, to be honest. I think you're going to have two, two different versions of the same document, I, I, I think, is the idea here. And then you fill in the data on one and it populates on the other as well. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that sounds like a Google Forms or Microsoft Forms type of 
project or, or, or a thing to do. Um, Richard, I can give you kind of my take on this question. Yeah, I, I, your, your take was a little different on it. Yeah, and I think what Tova's talking about is the idea that, that instead of using the same thing every time to, to achieve a particular end, got two totally different versions to put in front of the students and that, you know, it might even be that Tova is working to identify like what, what represents a strength with different students. And if, if that is what Tova is doing, style points to Tova, that's actually very cool. Recognizing that that may mean doubling up the work if you're doing it in docs. I would actually encourage Tova to consider creating this in sheets because you can use the import range function to be able to pull the same data from say another sheet and bring that in so you can have your two different variations on the theme, but it's drawing from the same info. Now you have to kind of get, get to where you're playing with sheets so that you can make it look interesting enough to be say, not a sheet. But but if you can get your sheet together, ah, oh, that was almost funny, not really. Um, then you can make this happen. <laughs> so so that, that's my take on Tova's, Tova's question number two. Yeah, that sounds like an Alice Keeler kind of question, doesn't it? It totally does, yeah. Uh, it sounds like that would be something right up her alley to do with uh, to do with Google Sheets, but maybe beyond my desire to dive that deep into Sheets. <laughs> you know, I think, I think I'll, I'll add to the links page, by the way, which if you registered for this, you will get, or you can just email me and let me know and I can get it to you that way. But I will get Alice Keeler's site on the... Uh, uh, site o plenty i'll just call it in in the in the thing so so you can get to that that is that is by the way at alicekeeler.com let me toss that in here for it's not active actually i just looked at the just tried to put the link in there and it's not working really I, i'm looking at it really yeah have you been living a righteous life is is there is there an issue in, in... Well, the link the link from our twitter page is not working hmm Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I started, I started with just alicekeeler.com. Yeah. All right. It's a mystery. Yeah. Which anyway. brings us to what, what next question? Brings, sorry. Brings us to the next question. I lost my place. Uh, oh, from Sonia. I have a question about audio files. I'm using Edpuzzle for video, but is there a program or another possibility to do the same with audio files? Uh, so that you have, students just listening to audio and then you interject with a question, I guess is probably the idea. Um, I think, I think that's Sonia's idea. And, and yeah. I, and, and here, here is my, my short answer is, uh, is there a program or another possibility to do this audio files? Not that I know. However, my longer answer would be throw this into any simple video editor so that you've got your, your audio file there, just stick any static image as the visual and then create a video. And now you've got a video that has like this static image, but the audio file's in it. Now you can use it in an Edpuzzle. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be a, a fantastic simple solution. The other thing is going back in the Wayback Machine, VoiceThread is still active. You can still use VoiceThread. Uh, and that's a possibility to, to interject some questions into, uh, in, into the audio. So you can you can try that. Oh, uh, Richard, Richard, I, I I need to I need to jump in. So so one one of the, one of the audience members actually Donna Hensley says PlayPosit does this. Yes. Yep. So there we go. Let me let me get that link added to what we got going as well. So Donna, oh. style points for tossing that in there. Thank you. All right. Uh, one more question, Rushton. Let's do it. All right. So. Uh, this one came from Eli, who asked, uh, one of our teachers asked about grading short answer questions in Google Forms. He wants to know if there's the ability to auto-save scoring. Every time he puts in a point total for a completion of a short answer question, he has to hit save or risk losing all the scoring he has done. He doesn't want to, to click save so often. So uh, number one, it's probably you shouldn't have to click save in Google Forms. It should just save. But that said, who, you know, there's always something that, you know, everyone's Chromebook or desktop always has some quirk, right? So that aside, it sounds like he's doing it in the manner of tabbing through each student's response 
column or response page, I should say, you know, when you go into Google Forms and you look at the responses submitted within the form itself, you can grade it that way. But I always found it really annoying to grade it that way because I wanted to be able to just see the answers. I know what the questions are, right? Like when I'm grading, I already know, I, I wrote the questions. I know what they are. I just want to look at the answers. I just create a new spreadsheet and I go through the columns in the spreadsheet and read my students' short answers there. Now, I only do this for short answers that are not one-word answers, right? If they're one-word answers, you can have that automatically scored for you. But if you're talking about something like, in your own words, explain blah, 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 right? There's no way to automatically grade that. So I put that response, those all go into a Google Sheet. I'll read down through the column. I can see, okay, Billy wrote, da da da, da. Susie wrote, da 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 da, you know, next kid wrote, da da da, right? And I just grade it that way in a spreadsheet so much faster and then put the point total in, boom, it's all done. Uh, that's how I do it. Works much better for me than trying to tab through each response page. Uh, and I made a video about how to do that. So. Okay. Um, I, I would also add for Eli that, uh, uh, that that the teacher that Eli works with might look at formative, right? Because formative right. actually has, it seems to me, stronger grading options than does, say, classroom or, or right. form. It's how that works. Um, so, so, you know, I, it's one of those things where, you know, a teacher was showing me like what she was doing at the school where I do a lot of work. And, and I was like, oh, my God, look at all this, because, you know, with that, there, there was actually some very interesting work going on. First of all, allowing a very easy job of grading by question, but then uh, having it identify certain kinds of answers as being answers that could uh, that, you know, if if largely repeated could, you know, it could take a guess at the grade so that it could do some of the grading for you. For what that's worth. Um, but uh, still, interesting, interesting tech. So the for, the the folks behind Formative have, have done a lot of work to try to make that more and more and more useful to teachers, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I, I know we said that was going to be the last one, but here is really the last one. Bring it. Uh, it it's from Leslie, uh, who is working at a university and just transitioned to Canvas, and she's using the discussion feature with with her students for class topics and she wants to let them uh, participate in the discussion anonymously, but be able to see her students' names, or be able to see the students' names. And the built-in discussion tool in Canvas doesn't allow you to do that because it's either anonymous for everyone or visible to everybody, but not anywhere in between. If you wanna do something like, like this, I would suggest a simple solution. And I've done this myself with my high school students in the past, when I've done uh, back channel discussion, use back channel discussion tools. Have them pick nicknames that they don't share with other people except for you. And then you can see, okay, uh, the sparkly unicorn on my list of names, the sparkly unicorn equals Haley, right? and that's actually one of my, I, I, re, I had this student 12 years ago in class. I still remember sparkly unicorn equals Haley. Haley, by the way, is a kindergarten teacher herself now. Uh, that makes you know, sense, by the way. Just do the, you know, like, just have them write that out. Like Joe DiMaggio equals Billy, uh, you know, Roberto Clemente equals Sam, whatever it is, you know, let them pick those pseudonyms. You keep a list of them. They participate in the discussion. Everything's everything's good. Uh, you know, you can do that with any number of tools. Uh, the the one that I'm thinking of off the top of my head is Yo Teach uh, from Hong Kong Polytechnic. Uh, Yo Teach uh, is a great great little discussion tool you could use for, for that purpose. So give it give that a try. Well, before we finish up, I want everybody to know that that the every week Nexus puts out a new NVIV Nexus inspiring video. So it's like a wildly cool video with some prompts for discussion or writing. And this one is about this about this young man who's having trouble in school, but he was really into like music and audio. And in community college, actually found uh, found his stride when he got the chance to uh, 
uh, do a little work with, with whales, uh, research related to whales. And this, this actually takes us back to an earlier part of the show when we talked about Imbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is where you got to do this work, which is pretty cool. It's a great story. Give it a look. I uh, hope that you like those. You will see, always see the, the, uh, the most recent NVIV on the nextvista.org page, upper left. So feel free to give that a look. Uh, the, the newsletter is something for which, uh, you know, I put all kinds of cool things out there and I see that I didn't update that. Ah, bad man. Um, but <laughs> I do give away like a, a Starbucks card every month because why not? Uh, I've written some books. Feel free to give them a look. And if uh, you're curious about those, just contact me and happy to happy to talk to you more about that. And then there's this gem. What is this, Richard? Oh, I got we got to update that, that cover image there. Uh, the Practical EdTech Handbook, which I just updated uh, two weeks ago and, and sent out to everybody who's on my newsletter. If you're on my newsletter mailing list, you already got a copy of it. If you didn't get a copy of it, sign up for my mailing list, practicaledtech.com slash weekly dash newsletter. And I'll send you a copy of the Practical EdTech Handbook. On the next page, I also have an ebook made just for... Those of you who are tech coaches, tech specialists, media specialists, anyone who's ever been asked, hey, can you do a short tech workshop for us on Tuesday afternoon? This ebook is for you. 50 Tech Tuesday tips. You got your whole year planned right there. Go to my YouTube channel. I mentioned that earlier. I got 47 tutorials just about Canva, 400 and something tutorials about Google Workspace stuff. Check it out. There, there is no shortage of videos on your channel. Not yet. Good man. All right. Well, I hope I hope you have decided that the last half hour was well spent. Uh, fun for me to hang out with a friend, or Richard. Always good to, to be with you. And then we've got all these cool people in the chat we're about to open everything up to and uh, just, just talk about like the, the different things we've seen and what we experienced and all that kind of stuff, because why not? If you're if you're joining us for the live show, you get to do that, which is kind of cool and fun. So thank you very much for joining us this week, uh, or more than point this month. And mm -hmm. we will we will see you again in in early November somewhere. Watch our newsletters for information on that. Any last words for the audience, Richard? Vote early, vote often, <laughs> and follow the rules. Everybody, we'll take see care. You in November. See ya. See ya. Bye bye.